What is the difference between a banjo and an onion? Nobody cries when you cut up a banjo. This is the Righteous Bojambo, and it's time to talk about Charlie Poole. Country music seems to need the legend of the drunken, hell-raising and hell-bound hillbilly genius. It's part of its character, it seems, entwined in its DNA, much like the doomed prince of jazz or the hotel room smashing wild man of rock music. While Hank Williams looms so large in terms of that particular legend that he typifies it in its entirety for country music, in terms of mixing drunken hell-raising and scintillating musicianship, Charlie Poole wrote the damn book. He wrote the damn sequel and he wrote the foreword to Williams's and Lefty Frizzell's and George Jones's vast volumes of misdeeds. But Poole was more than a mere legendary rounder. He was the first bona fide superstar of hillbilly music. While Vernon Dalhart had, had a huge hit with the wreck of the old 97 in 1923, it was more of a steady seller over 20 years, ending up selling millions of copies before they finally took it out of circulation. Poole was a big seller almost from the get-go. While his first single sold only 5,000 copies, when they flipped it over to the B-side, Don't Let Your Deal Go Down, that sold over 102,000 copies in 1926, almost all of them in the South, where it was estimated there were only 6,000 record players in houses. It's understandable too that he became a star. Poole's bawdy, straightforward vocal style with its heavy Piedmont accent rings of authenticity and his band, the North Carolina Ramblers, usually a fiddle and guitar player backing Poole's unique banjo style, are tight and urgent and their interplay is constantly superb. If Poole isn't ground zero for country music, then he's the first aftershock and he was the tidal wave that followed. He cut around 60 songs and most every one of them is fantastic. If the river was whiskey, old and only in the way, Baltimore fire, Milwaukee blues, You Ain't Talking to Me, which was quoted by Bob Dylan in his Nobel acceptance lecture, Take a Drink on Me, Hungry Hash House and Goodbye Booze. All are particular classics. These records are the pattern not only for the country music to come, but also presage the development of bluegrass, the first and one of the most significant offshoots of country music. Poole didn't write his own songs, he sang old songs, or he appropriated pop hits of a generation before and gave them to the folk song form. He did record a couple of sides of waltz tunes and some classical banjo pieces, but they didn't sell very well. He knew what people wanted to hear and he played them that. When he didn't have the songs to sing or he'd drunk up all his money, he went back to working alongside them in the mills. But, or maybe so, the people in the shanty towns outside the mills and the mining camps he rambled through, singing, drinking, fighting, they loved him. He was, quite possibly, the first true populist folk hero of the American mass communication era. He was a voice, however flawed and contradictory, of his people in those changing times and they were feeling pressured to abandon a way of life and its attendant values due to economic and social factors intimate to its time and place and not shaped by external factors seeking to exploit the talent as a novelty on record and he was a voice for people who were hurriedly being wiped off the map of America. But all this was not without inherent dichotomy as much as Poole presented as a man of the people, and his songs as the voice of those people, he always took great care to wear a blue serge suit and a bow tie when dealing with the record company folks from New York City, lest they think he were a hillbilly. 
His contemporary and successor Jimmy Rogers had a similar quirk. Whenever he was required to perform in costume as the singing brakeman or a railroad hobo, he always made sure he was wearing a pair of white silk socks just to remind him that he had come a long way from his hard scrabbling days. One fascinating thing I do find about Poole's music and the songs that he chose is that in his entire catalogue, brief as it may be, there isn't a single mawkish down-home hymn, no desperate plea to the saviour to pull him back from his booze-loving honky tonkin ways. There's no I saw the light to sing on Sunday morning after the honky-tonk blues of Saturday night. There's no Ernest Tubbsian concept of Saturday Sinner, Sunday Saint. Charlie Poole was on the highway to hell, and he sang about enjoying every moment of it. But let us return from speculation metaphysical to speculation more on the times and circumstances of Charlie Poole, as the lifestyle of Appalachian people changed in the late 1920s. We spoke previously of a great change. That great change was set against the backdrop of a rural people's deracinated by the disruptive effects of industrialization, both through the loss of their local base jobs as factories moved in, and then their lifestyles pressurized by the demands of having to seek, work, and live in communities created around those very factories. Hamlet became village, village became town, town became city. Through both the increase of population from workers drifting out of the high rural hills towards the factories, but also through the deleterious effects of real estate speculation in the Piedmont to Hill area. This all came to a head in the 1928 Rhododendron Festival in Asheville, North Carolina, some three hours south of Poole's traditional base around Eden, which was in the Virginia border country. Bascom Lunsford was asked to organise as a sideshow, as a spectacle for tourists to gawp at, a display of traditional mountain music, which ended up attracting over 5,000 people to see it, much distracting from the Rhododendron Festival, which was basically a local push for tourist dollars and real estate money. So communities was still choosing local traditional entertainment which reminded them of lost or receding values over the corporate forms coming from the record companies based in the far-flung entertainment capitals. Charlie Cleveland Poole was a romantic and possibly over-romanticised figure emerging from the people who sang the songs of the Hill People tradition but, as mentioned, wore a blue serge suit and a bow tie so that people wouldn't take him for a hillbilly. He was an illiterate, but he was quoted by a Nobel Prize winner for literature in their acceptance speech. All of these contradictions, but he was accepted for it because he was a voice for those people. Bearing in mind that the notion of getting a bum's one's raising is still a potent force today, but Poole had the force of personality and the means to transcend that, that managed to overcome it. And that force of personality was in a musician who was a peerless showman. Some say he was the best clog dancer in North Carolina, which is a dubious claim, but the showman is entitled to some puffery. And he was particularly famous for his flips, cartwheels and handstands, which he'd spontaneously performed from stage. Perhaps people buying more of Poole's records than there were record players was more about people simply wanting a souvenir of Poole, a token of their affiliation with him, than his actual product, which effectively made Poole a genuine celebrity, one birthed and celebrated 500 miles at least from the nearest Great White Way of celebrity. It might have been that that fatal telegram summoning Poole to the great mecca of all that is celebrity may have been a suitably ironic denouement for the homegrown people's champion. Ah, but I suspect this isn't enough, not for my dedicated viewer. What they really want when they think of Charlie Poole is a tale of bawdy mayhem and affray, of shenanigans of the highest order, of rock star antics in a ten-cent town. Of course, 
Would that every story about Charlie Poole were true, there'd be no time for music, and he wouldn't even have lived as long as he did. But this one has so many dates, locations, weapons, number of combatants, and versions, that I've had to try to go with the most realistic sounding one that I could. Now, before he was a famous musician, and uh, during the time as well, I guess, Charlie ran Moonshine. One evening he was returning from a run and bringing a partially crippled brother-in-law, Posey Rora, who was recovering from surgery for Clubfoot, back from Baltimore. The police raided the bootlegger's nip joint where Charlie and his confederates were playing. And Charlie, being the argumentative type, started a ruckus with a deputy sheriff who told Poole to consider himself under arrest. Well, Charlie's reply was predictable. Consider hell! and he brought his banjo down over the deputy's head, which went through the banjo's body, and these things were made of maple, so it must have really hurt when that clock woke up, and left the neck of the banjo hanging like a necktie on the unfortunate peace officer. Now, at this point, it gets complicated. Charlie then went to grab the next weapon to hand, which was Posey Rora's fiddle, but Rora snatched it back, and despite his, to that very moment, disability, ran for his life. Another deputy then stuck his gun in Charlie's ear and cocked the hammer. Charlie yanked the gun away, but it went off and hit him in the mouth, which burned his lips and chipped a few of his teeth. Now, it's at this point, they say, that Charlie got really mad. Posey Rora had left behind his walking cane, which Charlie then used to club the remaining deputy, held west and crooked, and walked out, as Posey Rora said, bloodied but unbound. When he went up for trial for the fracker, the judge asked Poole if he needed a good lawyer. Poole said, no sir, but I could use some better witnesses. Now, that makes George Jones driving his lawnmower 16 miles to and from to get to a liquor store. Seem kind of penny ante, doesn't it? But back to our unfolding tragedy. His fatal doom came in 1931. Work as a musician done got hard and his records weren't selling so well. Poole was notorious for keeping recording royalties to himself for drinking money. It was the discovery of this which led to the disestablishment of the original North Carolina Ramblers in 1928. So he went home to his wife Lou Emma, who was of course Posey Rora's sister, and back to work in the mills. Out of the blue, in early 1931, he received an offer and advance to travel to Hollywood for to, some say, score a film, others say appear in one, and others yet say star in one. Whatever the story, Charlie Poole just wasn't the kind of fella you gave a weighty advance of cash to and just expected to turn up on the train in Hollywood in three days' time. No siree. Charlie did what Charlie did most times he got a little money together. He went a-ramblin'. And didn't he indeed ramble? So Charlie's celebration jaunt turned into a three-month death spiral that bended to literally end all benders. When his money and his time and his will to go on were done, well, Charlie went home to die. The end came for him at his sister's house, some say romantically collapsing and expiring on her front porch as he arrived, desperate for her ministrations and forgiveness. But it was actually in an upstairs bedroom, his last words being, Oh, Charlie's been drunk before. The one thing we do know for sure was that on May 31st, 1931, old Charlie finally quit drinking. What such a death lacks in the romance, pathos and genuine mystery of silently passing in the back of a Cadillac on some godforsaken West Virginia back road, it gains in notoriety as the moment the owner of country music's first authentically timeless catalogue cashed in his chips and closed his book. Let us then summarise quickly. We have digressed at length on social factors, cultural genocide, various deeds of shady dealing and carpetbaggery, the drinking, the fights, the skullduggery, the merry old gang of Royster Doisters, and the tragic death. But the one thing we perhaps haven't spoken on near enough is the music. That's largely because the music tends to speak for itself. Time spent with the playlist included below will amply demonstrate that. 
Quill took his eclectic mix of tunes and undeniable showmanship across not just the Piedmont and Virginia border country, but to dances, halls, hootenannies, parties and corn shucks through Virginia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, Southern Ohio and Southeastern Pennsylvania, toting a load of moonshine with him, no doubt, always playing for the same kind of people, the displaced and declassé of the Appalachian Mountains. By 1928, he'd sold a million records, Columbia frequently having to chase him to record, but radio and a slew of new competitors, brought up in the wake of Ralph Peer's astonishing 1927 Bristol sessions, started a push pool to the fringes. In 1930, there was an attempt to set him up with a radio program in West Virginia, but, well, three guesses as to why that failed. In the end, there was life back in the mills, the ever-forgiving Lou Emma, and eventually, a last mad dash to doom. Even had his music adapted, it's unlikely Poole would have. He just wasn't built to think of the future. He was hardwired for the moment. For him to have become a cantankerous elder statesman like, say, Jimmy Martin was unthinkable. It was to be a short life, but a gay and merry one for Charlie. Poole slipped into obscurity shortly after his death. Posey Rora died shortly after he, Lou Emma in 1967, and his son Jimmy from his first marriage at 19, the year after that. Many years later, fans in Ireland paid for the impressive tombstone where he lays, and every year, more or less, the Charlie Poole Festival in Eden pays tribute to the town's most notorious ambassador. Poole once sang, If I lose, I win. No more eloquent philosophy could sum up the life of the first titan of American country music. Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. I certainly hope that you found today's presentation to be enjoyable and that it piqued your curiosity. For comment and further discussion going forward, a couple of questions. Firstly, tell me please of your favourite stories of musical mayhem, anarchy and monkey shines that have been perpetrated by various doers down through the years. The more outrageous, drunk up and involving nakedness, the better, obviously. And a second question. How long does a song, a popular song, have to be in the public canon for it to transcend the public canon and become a folk song? I'd very much value your thoughts. In any case, until we speak again next time, or the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down. You keep listening to the good stuff and you stay righteous. Hell before you hell bound. Okay.